I get to do a lot of neat venues, but I don't think I've ever been in a room quite as fantastic as the theater at the Royal Institution. And uh, I have many friends and colleagues in the audience, although, forgive me, I can't quite see in these lights very well. But uh, I've been excited about this possibility since Sean and I met in October. Uh, we met over at IMEC-E, the Mechanical Engineers Institute. And uh, the more I thought about it, the fact of being in this room which 160 years ago is where John Tyndall explained the radiation prop or the radiative, the, the heat properties of the greenhouse gases, particularly carbon dioxide, which in effect led us to the problem. And uh, others talked about it, I mean, Svante Arrhenius, uh, uh, a Swede, and uh, Joseph Fourier. But right here in this room, um, following on his predecessor with uh, Michael Faraday, John Tyndall really got into the heart of what became the climate change crisis. And so to be here 160 years later is wonderful. In doing research for this, I came across another interesting fact, which is that there was not much attention to it back then because people weren't concerned about climate change. But there was another thing going on in London. That was the time of the big stink. I don't know if you know about that. But the London sewer system was put in to deal with the reality that the Thames had become the city's sewer. And whether it be human waste or rotting animals or, or garbage, it all wound up in the Thames. And it had been talked about for years. But finally, Parliament, um, I think it was 1859, I think it was the same year as Tyndall's talk, decided that they needed to put in a sewage system. And Joseph, uh, Sir Joseph, uh, Baselgett, yes, um, was in charge of the project, and it took him about eight years. But the interesting thing was, and the relevance to this is, for years people had complained about the problem. But until people started dying of cholera, and it just became to the point where the city stank so bad that it really couldn't function, and despite London's pride about being the cultural and science capital and financial capital, here you had this tremendous sewer. And so finally, after decades of putting off and procrastinating, saying, oh, it'll be very difficult, it'll be very expensive, and we can't afford this, they were backs against the wall, and they did it. And the same kind of thing happened with sprinkler systems after deaths from fires. Um, and the same thing happened with the Thames barrier, if you want to bring it forward. We'll talk about that in a minute. But the storm of 1953 which overnight killed 1,836 people in the Netherlands and 307 in England and 24 in Belgium. That led to the Thames barrier. So we tend to make big changes and expensive projects when tragedy has happened, when a lot of people have died. And that's understandable. But I hope you join me in thinking about that with this one, climate change in general and sea level rise in particular, we really can't wait for the tragedy to fully unfold to begin to deal with it. And therein lies a particular challenge for all of us. And some of you may have uh, capacities in, in one way or another, either connections or what you do, or uh, would like to find out more about our International Sea Level Institute, which I'm going to tell you about in a few minutes, uh, that ways that we can help expand the audience. So I start with an image of Antarctica. We're going to come back to that in a few minutes. That kind of, that's kind of the scene of the crime or where the crime will happen, if you will, of where sea level is going to really take place. But I, um, this evening, I want to narrow my focus. This isn't about climate change broadly. It's not about greenhouse gas emissions broadly, although I want to start there. I want to talk about how flooding from sea level rise is different but related to the other forms of flooding from storms that we think about and heavy rainfall floods, which run off downhill and can multiply, and then the tidal effects, which are happening more and more. The, the high tides, or king tides, they're sometimes called. But sea level is kind of the drip filling the bucket. It's the less dramatic, less non-sudden event that will raise all the water levels. And what I'm going to frame for you tonight is that for 
really all of human civilization, it hasn't changed much. And that's why we get fooled. So, uh, and then we'll talk about scenarios, what can happen, different projections and possibilities. Talk about impacts. We want to think locally, what's happened to my house and my city and my country. But of course, it's a global challenge, and we have to think about it from both the transportation, supply chain, national security, and humanitarian concepts. And then certainly, the most important question probably is, what's the path forward? I mean, first of all, I should say you're brave people to come out tonight. There's a, it shows you have an inquiring scientific mind to even want to come and learn about this. I dare say that if we did a survey of 100 of your uh, friends or 100 people at random in London or the, certainly the United States, that most would not come. They're either not interested or they don't want to know or they don't want to get bummed out. That's true. So, I, again, I, I really do applaud that, uh, and it's no surprise, of course, that the, the audience for the Royal Institution, which has been doing this for 220 years, taking science to the public, Again, while there are lots of places, we have the Smithsonian in the United States, and I know there's other institutions around the world, but globally, there's no place that's more reputed as the place to explain science in plain language, you know, to a very wide audience of interested persons. So um, thank you again. And again, it was here, John Tyndall. That's a sketch, the same Faraday desk. I mean, it's really quite remarkable to... Uh, to be in the same room where he explained that, as Michael Faraday had about magnetism. Now, magnetism was probably a lot more interesting. Um, when we look at the atmosphere, I mean, Tyndall didn't have the benefit of a space uh, sh a satellite photograph or from a spacecraft or this uh, International Space Station, but it's really quite remarkable that the Earth, which we know is large, it's 8,000 miles diameter, roughly 25,000 circumference. But the atmosphere is that arc of a line. It's about 10 miles at most, 60,000 feet, depending on how you define what the outer edge is. In comparison to the size of the Earth, it's hard to even see it. I mean, on the typical globe, it's about the thickness of the, cell of the uh, plastic coating on the outside of the globe. And that's what's been changing. And it's been changing since, we, we know, since burning fossil fuels, but it became an issue about 170 years ago. Yet we're still struggling to understand it. Now, this video, and I'm not too sure how we're going to start this, but this is going to show carbon emissions starting in the year 1751. It's done by a group called the, Clim the Carbon Project. And it's going to show how emissions have increased around the world, showing a color scale there. Blue is kind of the lowest, and then it gets up to red. And in one minute, it's quite remarkable. It's going to show us how CO2 emissions really encircled the globe and started right here in London. So let's uh, figure out how to make this work. If you look at the lower left there, it's um, 17, 16, we're 17, yeah, 70, um, and we're at four, 4 million metric tons. You can barely see a blue tinge over southern England, right? Can you all see that in this light, I hope? Great. And now it's getting more to the yellow, and it's spreading into Europe, and the United States is coming alive a little bit, right? Eastern United States. We're up to year 1890, year 1900, and we're up to almost a billion metric tons a year of carbon dioxide. Now the world's really starting to light up across Europe. Asia's starting to come into the picture. We're up to now the 1980s. And that's all with the same measurement system, the best they can go back and recreate. This was done by a combination of uh, some nonprofits, but Oak Ridge Laboratories in the US, one of the research centers. Um, quite remarkable as a graphic depiction of how in 250 years, more or less, emissions of carbon dioxide, which John Tyndall, again, put the quantities to in terms of its uh, heat trapping effects. Is that? Okay. Um, the world's warmer. You've probably seen different depictions. I like this one. It's pretty simple. It says that over 100 years, this is done by NASA, if we look at the heat 
averaged over five years, this was 2011 to 15, so a five-year period, compared to the prior century, how has the temperature signature of the world changed to their best ability to re recreate it? And we can talk about how we do that. But the blue would be cooler. There's no place that's blue. There's some places that have a tinge of blue, but they're right off of Greenland and Antarctica because of all the meltwater, which is cooling the ocean there. So that's why we're kind of neutral for the century and temperature change. But of course, the yellow and red, orange and red is the warming. And most of the heat goes to the Arctic. And you've probably seen pictures of this, but I think it's a very nice depiction, which kind of lays the groundwork for what's happening in the Arctic and the melting sea ice and the, the glaciers on Greenland. Climate change, if we uh, just take a simple Venn diagram here, if we think of that as the, the green in the middle, from my perspective, and this is not a, a absolute across the board, but I think we should separate it into three categories. The energy part, which is the black circle, how to reduce the greenhouse gases, and I'm going to talk about that. And again, that ties back into Tyndall's work. That's certainly important. And there's lots of people working on how do we reduce our emissions? How do we slow the warming? And it's very appropriate and, and absolutely critical. And then we also have to work about the effects, the water, the weather changes, the warming temperature, the, the extreme heat, in fact, in places, the ecological impacts, disease changes, food supply. What's happening in a world that's getting warmer, where the oceans are um, evaporating more, putting more moisture in the air? We'll talk about those effects. But so that's the, the orange circle. And then the blue rising sea level, where I've specialized, is part of the orange, if you will. It's a special effect. But it's, it's important because it changes the shoreline, and it changes real estate and it has the most direct economic effect, and it's a way to get people engaged who might not care about the other two circles. That's why I use it that way, and I certainly recommend it you know, for you to consider. When people are even skeptical or, or don't think we can get off carbon, and then we talk about the flooding that's happened, as I'm gonna show you, that starts to get their attention, regardless of their political persuasion. I'm going to come back to this graph a few times, and I'm going to tell you how to get this graph. In fact, it's really simple. It's slides at johnenglander.net. Just send an email. You'll get instructions to download it. You're welcome to use this, but let me talk you through it. And again, I'm going to show it a few times tonight. You don't have to get it all now. The top line in green is carbon dioxide. The red line is global average temperature, and the blue line is sea level. So really easy to remember. Green for greenhouse, red for heat, and blue for water, right? And it's 400,000 years from left to right. If we follow the red line, that's four ice age cycles. Now, for those scientists, bear with me. We're still in an ice age, technically, in geoscience, because there's polar ice caps. But in the normal use of the term, the ice ages are the peak periods, or glacial maximums, and so I use it that way. I, more, impor more important to me is to communicate to a wider audience than to follow scientific protocol because we've got to communicate better. And so the, if we think of the last ice age cycle as 22,000 years ago, which was just the peak of what is the continuing ice age cycle that's been going for a few million years, we see an interesting pattern. It's pretty evenly spaced. It's something called the Milankovitch cycle. It has to do with uh, the tilt and wobble and elliptical shape of the Earth around the sun. But I just say it's kind of like a super summer and winter. And for the same reason that summer and winter are different temperatures. Distance and heat, heat you know, the amount of heat we absorb. We don't think any more complicated than that. That's what the ice ages have been. We've had them for about three or four million years. I'm showing you 400,000 years here because I can show you a little more detail. But this graph could go 10 times to the left. So we have the ice age cycles, and we're at the warm spot. And that's 5 degrees Celsius warmer than the cold point. And that's the average ice age difference, global. Carbon dioxide, the greenhouse gas at the top, goes from 180 to 280 parts per million, approximately. Easy numbers to remember. You'll notice I. I really avoid technical numbers that you have to memorize. 
Now, the problem is the carbon dioxide, as you'll see in the little red circle at the upper right, is at 410 parts per million. You've probably heard about that, our concern about where the greenhouse gases are going, particularly carbon dioxide, because that's liberated from fossil fuels. And um, you'll notice the green and red lines go together. There's two different physics principles involved. I'm going to try and give you a couple of simple physics principles here. When the oceans warm, they release carbon dioxide, just like taking a bottle of soda or, or uh, you know, um, mineral water that, that's uh, got bubbles in it. And if you, if you heat one and leave another one cold, the hotter one will release the gas quicker. Okay, warm, warm liquids release dissolved gases. So that's why when the Earth has gone through a, a warming cycle by the Ice Age cycles, it releases carbon dioxide. But now, because of the work of John Tyndall and others, we're in a new era. We're putting more carbon dioxide in the air, in the atmosphere, and that's trapping heat, as his experiments proved. And then, of course, if the red goes up and gets warmer, the ice sheets are going to melt, and we're going to look at that in a moment. That's why sea level changes. So that's why those three things peak together, those three lines. And there's a they're fairly regular period because of the tilt, the wobble, and the uh, elliptical shape of the orbit around the sun. There'll be time for questions. Um, ice cores, that's how we get the carbon dioxide percentages and actually temperature, surprisingly. The uh, ice cores from Greenland go back 140,000 years. The ice cores from Antarctica go back 800,000 years. They correlate. That's why we know they're good science. Uh, about two dozen countries and agencies doing that these days, decoding past CO2 and temperature from those ice core samples. The, the bright little white dots there between the person's fingers are air samples. And we can tell temperature because of the relative molecular weight of oxygen 16 and 18, two isotopes, not to get technical, but there's sound, simple science that's behind our ability to decode these ice cores into temperature and carbon dioxide. So the other takeaway from this, this chart to keep in mind is that it's about 100,000 years between cycles because of those different orbital variations that line up to 95 and 120,000. That's why the ice ages have happened for millions of years. It's also interesting to note that there's about an 80,000-year downstroke and about a 20,000-year upstroke. Is that easy to see, right? They're not, it's not 50-50. And we've just come out of the 20,000-year warming period. The reason we thought sea level was stable was it's like going up to a marina or a harbor at high tide and having your sandwich and leaving 20 minutes later and saying, what are they talking about, the water going up and down? You know, during that slack water, right, the water level stayed high 20 minutes. Well, the 5,000 years of human civilization, recorded history, happened at the turning point when sea level by its natural course had finished rising 390 feet, 120 meters, as it had done for millions of years. And left to its own devices, the world would have probably gotten us back into a cooling cycle. But the 7.5 billion of us, headed to 10 billion, changed the atmospheric chemistry and physics. And so we're now in a warming period, whereas by nature it's pretty clear to me, and I think to most of you probably, that almost certainly we would have been entering the slow period toward the next ice age. Well, we don't have to worry about that anymore. We're not going to have another ice age in the foreseeable future. So you can put the winter clothes away. Um, I will try and get you to laugh a couple of times, by the way. And, uh, and I, I, should, I should have said that up front. This is a pretty <laughs> dark subject in some ways, but again, you obviously have inquiring scientific minds and you want to help uh, get the word out, and I appreciate that. But I will suggest to you, and I mean most sincerely, it's like going to the doctor and getting some bad news. And we've all either done that or, or had friends or family who have been in that position. And you'd really need to keep your sense of humor to deal with challenges and to move forward, not only for ourselves and our sanity, but for the next generation. And, and those to, to come. So I'm very, I really feel strongly that you can't just depress people. And there are some things in this world which are not too fun to think of. Uh, we all know many of them. Getting older is one of them. 
okay? It's not fun, but what are the other alternatives, you know, <laughs> as they say? So uh, I will tr- endeavor to, to get you to uh, you know, lighten up once or twice just to think about things uh, with a bit of humor so that we can plot our path forward. As sea level goes up and down, almost 400 feet, about 120 meters. And again, I just use rough numbers. There's no need at our level of science. It's not like uh, uh, Professor Wadhams here who actually goes to the Arctic and measures things and gets it down to the three decimal points, which is exactly what, what a scientist needs to do. But to communicate science, we don't need to do that. In fact, we get lost in the, in the detail. And so I, I recommend against it. But carbon dioxide broke out of the 180 to 280 parts per million, and it's now at 410. And there's a lag time for the warming to happen and for the ice to melt and for the sea to rise. It's not going to happen instantly. It's going to take decades or centuries. It started, and we're going to look at that. Um, what's pretty interesting and um, disconcerting is if you, div- if you divide the numbers in sea level by the temperature change, if that makes sense, the 360 feet, let's call it, of sea level rise by the 5 degrees Celsius of, of temperature, we're into something like 20 meters per degree Celsius. We've already warmed a degree. Does that make sense? In other words, with each of those cycles, temperature, global average changes 5 degrees Celsius, and sea level changes about 120 meters. So just dividing 100 by 5, I mean, to keep it really simple, that's about 20 meters of sea level adjustment. Now, it may not stay at the same ratio as we get warmer and warmer, but there's some other problems as the Arctic melts and changes weather patterns. You all know the shape of Florida. Many of you have probably been to Florida. I happen to live in Florida. I travel a lot, but um, that's home at the moment. And uh, very distinctive shape, of course, and uh, probably known around the world. Anybody could pick out Florida. Nice place to go in the winter. If we go back 20,000 years ago, when the ice sheets covered North America and Europe, Florida was twice the size because sea level was down 390 feet. And if we go back to 120,000 years ago, the last warm spot, more technically called the Eemian, Sparta was half the size. Pretty striking. I mean, we could do that with Vietnam, or in fact, we could do it with Great Britain, we could do it with any place in the world, but Florida being fairly flat, and a peninsula like that really really reflects it quickly. Um, That happened because of the ice ages. And uh, I don't know if you saw the four-part scientific series, Ice Age... Part two, the meltdown. How many saw that? Well, behind Manny, Diego, Sid, and Scott. My daughter was six at the time this came out. I've watched this 40 or 50 times. I have this pretty well memorized. It's entertaining. Pretty good science, actually. There's two miles of ice behind the critters, creatures. And as that 10,000 feet of ice melted, sea level rose 400 feet. Does that make sense? You can teach that to anybody. That's about all they need to know in terms of the geophysics proof of sea level and and the ice age. Because nobody disputes we've had ice age. It was documented in this series, right? So, of course, if we look since the last ice age, as depicted in that that movie, and sea level, and this is a cleaned-up diagram from a scientific chart that many of you are quite familiar with, the post-glacial era, the last 20, 22,000 years, Again, to make it really simple to communicate. And this is in the slide pack I'll give you if you just write to slides at johnenglander.net. You can do it later, you can do it now, whatever. You'll get a link to download a a dozen or so slides with all the graphics. So there's two important takeaways, or three, actually. One is sea level did not rise smoothly. It's not a straight line or even a curved line. It's not going to be a smooth line or a curved line. We need to get over that. Two is, there's three inflection points there. Those red arrows, in science we call them inflection points, they're changes of slope. It was going like this, and then it went like this. And if you're at one of those points in time, and you look to the recent past and say, well, what's happening here? Because I want to predict out in the future where it's going to go. You're going to get bad information. It'd be like driving your car by looking in the rearview mirror. 
what's behind you doesn't tell you what's ahead of you, right? Now, in engineering and insurance and other professions, we often say that if we look back 10 years or 100 years, we can kind of get a sense of what's going to happen in the future. In science, that's called a stationary environment, that all else hasn't changed as, a, as the environment in which to look at this. But that's not the case here. We're five degrees warmer than at the cold spot of the ice age, and we're one degree warmer than we should be at the warm cycle. And so things are changing. So what happened over the last century, even 30 years, is not going to tell us what's going to happen in the next 30 years. I'm sorry, I should have backed up there. And the other big takeaway, of course, is sea level got to the present level about five or 6,000 years ago. That's pretty much recorded human civilization. If you think about the Christian era 2,000 years, and you go back to the Chinese and Jewish calendars and Mayan calendars, you know, Old Testament days, you get back 5,000 years. But 20,000 years ago is not that long ago for the Ice Age. But the important thing is that our recorded human history five, six, 8,000 years, certainly no more than 10, recorded human history, sea level's been pretty stable for most of that time. No wonder we have trouble believing it's going to change. It's not like, you know, earthquakes or avalanches that we've seen. So this perspective of four ice age cycles is very useful. If we look at actual sea level in the last, in the 20th century, and again, I'm round figures, this goes back to 1850, I think, yes. Um, this pretty much gets us back to the tide gauge record, which is how water levels were kept in various stations around the world, looking at tide gauges. And a uh, pretty good picture, and some of them got pretty sophisticated. The little red line at the top here is when the satellite era started. 1992 was the first, uh, I think it was Topex, the first satellites that could measure sea surface height, down to millimeters. It's amazing the technology that we were able to, you know, to do with that kind of uh, equipment. And uh, gave us a little better definition. And you can see, though, it's a pretty straight line, although it's starting to curve upward. It's the early stage of exponential growth. And I'll come back to that here in just a second. This is a little more detailed. This looks at just the satellite record since 1993, as I said. And as you'll I think can follow here, I and mean, that's just showing some of the satellites, but it was 1.5 millimeters a year. Then the last, since 1998, it's been 3.2 millimeters a year, and now in the era since 2011, it's 5 millimeters a year. The average is 3.31. It depends upon your measurement span, right? Once you get the average. But here's the thing that should get our attention. 1.5 to 3.2 to 5, that's doubling. We have real trouble understanding doubling or exponential growth. In fact, a quote that I love, there's a professor, a late professor, Alan, Albert Allen Bartlett from Harvard said, the greatest shortcoming of the human race is our inability to understand the exponential function. Now, maybe that's an, an overstatement, but let me just uh, run an example by you. Because exponential growth is really surprising. I think you know the thing about starting with a penny and doubling it every day for a month or a grain of rice on a checkerboard and you, you run out of rice in the world by the last square or the 64th square. But here's an interesting one. You, you know this football stadium, I'm sure. If you start with a drop of water in the center infield and double it every minute, so the second minute there's two drops and then four drops and then eight, how long for the stadium to be filled with water? Think about it for just a moment. I'm going to tell you the answer. Well, I'm going to have a bet with each of you for, for a beer afterwards, okay? Um, pardon? One hour? Not, not bad. 47 minutes. What's a drop? There is, there is a def... I, Good question. Fair enough. There is a definition. We can look it up. Um, I, I've, I've done the estimate. On the back of the envelope, it, it pencils out. Okay, but fair question. It may be 49 minutes. It may be 44 minutes. Okay, and it depends upon the size of the stadium, too, which is the other question. Which stadium? It's not necessarily this one, but doubling does that. Talk about football scores or something? Okay. Um, so what causes sea level rise? Here's another interesting thing. I, I've talked to about 300 audiences in six years since my book came out, and uh, I estimate maybe 10,000 people. So you're another 
300, I guess, tonight, something like that, which is a great audience. Most people associate sea level rise with melting icebergs for obvious reasons. I'm not going to embarrass anybody here, but how many here would have answered that question affirmatively? See, I don't want to, oh, a few, okay, honest people. Most people assume that's the, that's the case. Now, icebergs are giant ice cubes. And you can run this experiment at home. We don't even need to do it here on the Faraday desk, okay? But we all know that ice cubes stick out of the water about 10%, it said. Actually, it's just between 9 and 10%. They're a miniature iceberg. And so you can mark the level of liquid or fill the glass and, and get ice to the top and just let it melt. The water level won't change. And the reason is a very peculiar property of water. It's that just before water freezes, it expands slightly. People say, I mean, how could that be? But it's one of the miracle properties, and life on Earth would not be what it was if that property didn't exist. The simple way I explain it, again, trying to find really common language, is the water molecules are really squishy, and they, tight, they get very tight with each other. But when you get into the ice and the hexagonal, or it looks like a cubic structure, that, that crystalline structure is less dense because of just what you'd visualize there. And that makes sense, right? I mean, you could explain that to anybody. So if ice is 9%, call it 10% roundup, less dense than water, that's why it floats, right? It's not Archimedes' principle, really. It's because the ice itself is less dense. Um, sorry, I actually had a slide there, forgot. Uh, but what's happening in the Arctic as we go from bright white ice, sea ice, to dark blue, almost black, it'd be like taking a white roofed house and painting it dark. Your heating bill will change, right? It absorbs more heat. And that's what's happening. And uh, again, we're, we're fortunate to have uh, Peter and Pia here this evening who are experts at this, who that's been their life's work. Um, the melting of the Arctic is what's changing weather patterns. It, the melting of the Arctic does not affect sea level directly. It's part of an, an equation, if we'll call it that. But the point I want to make about the melting of the Arctic is that this graphic shows in red how the Arctic sea ice has declined in area. The 13 squiggly lines behind it, right, these things, from night, we're trying to calculate by algorithms in the 200 years what would happen to the Arctic sea ice. And that's the British, the Americans, various centers, 13 different models. Now look at what's happened with the red decline of the sea ice compared to the 13 models. The sea ice has disappeared, melted, much faster than all of the models. Science is honest, and it keeps learning and tries to get better, but the fact is that our models of the world are not perfect, and there are factors that we're not able to quantify yet. And while some people think we may be exaggerating about climate change and sea level rise, the fact is this is pretty good proof, and I'll show you another one in a few minutes, that the scientific community of anything is understating climate risk. It's our methodology. Because nobody wants to say, well, it could be a one to a five, so I'll tell you it's going to be a three, and then it winds up being a two, and they say, aha, you're wrong. You know, you said it was going to be a three, and it was only a two. So science always errs on the side of saying what they know for certain, not what could happen. And that is the nature of science. In this case, because of the uncertainties about climate change and, and the glaciers, which we're going to get to, it works against us. So sea level rise comes from the melting of the ice on land. We think of it as glaciers, or glaciers in America. Um, and as ice, as the glacier gets to the water's edge and breaks off to an iceberg, that's like adding another ice cube to the glass. That definitely raises the level of liquid, and the meltwater does too. And right to the top, here we go. Um, that, uh, and that's why sea level rises. New icebergs melt water from land, 
and as the oceans warm, thermal expansion. You know, like roads can buckle in the summertime heat or keys don't go in a lock if in the cold winter temperatures. Substances change dimensions ever so slightly. But to put it in perspective, in the last century, we've had a degree Celsius of, of temperature rise and ocean warming, and the oceans rose by thermal expansion about four inches, about eight or 10 centimeters. About half of sea level rise in the last century has come from thermal expansion, from heating the oceans. And that'll continue, and it may accelerate a bit, but it's small stuff compared to the glaciers. So that's what we want to focus on. And in fact, just to put it right up there in front of you, the problem is two places. And it's only two places. It's Greenland and Antarctica. There's 24 feet of sea level locked up in Greenland and 186 feet in Antarctica. That's 210. All of the glaciers from the Alps to Alaska and so on make up another two or three feet a meter. So if we're going to get worried about the rate of sea level rise, not what's happening in the Arctic in general, but, the, but where sea level rise is going to come from of substance, it's only those two places. Everything else is just noise or distraction. I'm sorry, did, I guess I'm one behind here. That's not, oh, I see what happened. Okay, so, and, and the Arctic Ocean up there at the top uh, left there, there we go, circled in yellow. Um, the Arctic Ocean is peculiar because it's the floating sea ice and very important in terms of the planet's weather, but again, doesn't affect sea level. So in most maps, it's shown as blue as if it had all melted. Now it's on its way to doing that, unfortunately. But on some maps, you'll see Greenland and the Arctic Ocean all white. So it's kind of, kind of confusing. Greenland is surprisingly big. In fact, uh, we're running a a fact-finding expedition for our major donors to the Sea Level Institute, and I'll, I'll talk about that at the end, but I've been there six times, and I've been there with the U.S. Coast Guard and the Air Force and different uh, groups and uh, science and also uh, philanthropists, but it's, it's hard to describe Greenland size. The only way I can think to do it is it's bigger than the eastern United States. It's 1,600 miles north-south and 1,000 east-west. It's only got 56,000 inhabitants, so it's the least densely inhabited country in the world. It's the biggest island in the world. It's got a lot of interesting, um, exceptional characteristics. But it's about 80% covered by ice, and the ice is about two miles thick still. If you go up on the ice sheet, and we will do that this summer, and I, some of you have been there, I know, um, the relatively flat, table-like top of Greenland and Antarctica is not too dissimilar, a little, little more mountainous. Um, it's melting visibly. You can see the, the sheen of the melt there, and the water's kind of aggregating into different uh, little rivulets, and then they kind of work their way deeper into channels, and then they get, and they, they find a weak spot, basically, and the water then goes vertical and what's either called chimneys or moulons. There's now about a 1,000 of these moulons in Greenland, and the water gets down beneath the glacier and lubricates the glacier. So whereas we had two miles of ice moving along at, you know, a mile or two per year, and the water gets underneath there, and now they're doubling, tripling, and quadrupling speed. So as the glaciers move faster, they're going to break off into icebergs, which is going to add to the level, and, of course, the meltwater. In fact, I was stunned when I was in Greenland last April, just coming out of the winter season, and just doing a little tour of Alulasat, the town that most of us visit when we go there, uh, where the big glacier Jakobshaven is. And they said, well, the power plant's been shut down. And I thought, how could the power plant be shut down? Because it used to be diesel operated. And I said, so what are you using? And they said, well, hydropower. I said, you're using water power to, to power Greenland? Yeah. So it occurred to me, year round, that they have enough meltwater that they can generate electricity in the wintertime in Greenland is astounding. I mean, that was a jaw dropper for me, that they had a reliable enough source, they decommissioned the power plant, just put in some turbos, you know, some turbines. If you follow the glaciers, 
by this is the helicopter view, you can you can kind of whoops, you can see that it's a winding river of ice. I want to distinguish the flat ice sheet from the glacier, which is these rivers of ice. There's hundreds of them in Greenland. This is one of the bigger ones. And then when the water gets near the near the when the glacier gets near the ocean, it breaks off into more icebergs. And that makes sense. So we have an ice sheet, we have glaciers that are these rivers of ice, tens of miles, tens of miles long, and then an iceberg is a floating ice cube, but a big one. Antarctica. Antarctica is seven times more ice than Greenland. It's a little different geologically. It's more mountainous. It's uh, more solid, although there are some parts that still are, uh, go below the surface. We'll look at that here. In fact, in Antarctica, uh, which this is a colorized photo showing velocities of ice movement. So most of you have never been to Antarctica. How many have been to Antarctica? Let me, I bet there's been a few in this room. I know you have. Um, <laughs> um, okay, but maybe a dozen or so. But let's decode Antarctica, because it's really confusing. It's bright white, and it kind of all looks like a blob. There's four parts of Antarctica that I would suggest to you you should think about. East Antarctica is the big part. That's this. And it's pretty solid land with ice on top of it. It also tends to be the driest place on Earth because it's so cold, there's no moisture in the air. And what, does, what is there comes out as snow, so they get some snowfall in East Antarctica. West Antarctica is actually uh, some valleys and some mountains, and the ice is kind of makes it all look like it's the same as East, but it's a very different character because the glaciers there go underwater, like in valleys or fjords. I'm going to show you that in a second. So that's two parts. And then if you've been there on a cruise ship or expedition ship, you've probably been to Antarctic Peninsula. That's where most people go. And Antarctic Peninsula is quite unique because that's where it's warming the fastest and the ice is melting the fastest. And it's a pretty easy reason. It's a little peninsula out in the ocean, and the ocean has more heat content because it's water than air. So the water has a lot more heat content. And um, of course, it's closest to South America. So from a, from a pure transit standpoint, from Ushuaia or a Punta Arenas, it's easiest to get to. But we're seeing huge change there. And most of the press about the giant icebergs, like last summer, I think it was, that broke off from the ice shelf. Again, now you appreciate that that iceberg calving doesn't affect sea level directly. But as the ice shelves disintegrate, the glaciers on land can then flow into the ocean, and that will raise sea level. So it's confusing. But hopefully that breaks the, the code a little bit. So we have East Antarctica, West Antarctica. Whoops. West Antarctica, then the Antarctic Peninsula. And then the one other area you should understand is the ice shelves, these large gray areas. And there's a little one up here that, that's where the big iceberg calved from. The ice shelves, well, I have an image in a moment I'll show you. That what, they're thick slabs of ice, but they're resting on the water mostly. So again, they act, they, from a sea level standpoint, they behave more like an iceberg, but they add to the confusion. The place that we need to keep our eyes on are these six glaciers. This is kind of an aerial view of that 8 o'clock position where the red arrow was. The Pine Island Glacier or the Thwaites Glacier, it's been in the news a lot recently. I don't know if you've seen it or not. But it's accelerating. They discovered a cavity underneath this glacier that was estimated to be 1,000 feet tall and to be the size of uh, two-thirds of New York City was the, was the visual that that the article cited, and uh, the NASA press release, in fact, came out on January 30th. These six glaciers have three meters or 10 feet of sea level locked up in them. We do not know how quickly they're going to melt and slide into the sea, and it's unknowable. Just for the same reason you can go to the Alps in Switzerland you know, tomorrow and ask about when the next avalanche will happen. Or if you went out to San Francisco and you said, OK, I've heard you had a big earthquake here 100 years ago. When will the next one be? And in spite of the fact that we have 2,000 strain gauges measuring tremors, nobody knows when the next big earthquake's going to come. Nobody's going to know when the next big mudslide will happen in any of the communities where mudslides are a risk. Those geophysical things where it's the crystalline structure and 
various nuances of water, you know, and, and dryness and so on, they don't model, real, I mean, they model. They don't turn into precise predictions is the problem. We know these six glaciers by gravity will wind up in the ocean sooner or later. The challenge is we don't know exactly how much of them is going to make it into the sea by the year 2100, 81 years from now, which is the benchmark used for climate change measurements, which frankly I think is a bit misleading. We need to be thinking about 30 years from now. That's a home mortgage cycle. It's a generation. It's something we can look at. And by mid-century, Peter and I had dinner last night actually in Cambridge and talked about this. I mean, by mid-century, I mean, every scientist is going to have their own interpretation. But most of us now think, I'm speaking for myself, not Dr. Wadhams, but most of us think, you know, we really could get a couple of feet or a meter of sea level rise by mid-century. It doesn't sound very precise, but this is why. It is not possible to model. That, the big glacier there is the size of Florida. We don't even know how warm the planet's going to be. How could we possibly tell you the rate the glacier will melt and move if we don't know whether we're going to burn all the coal on the planet or the tar sands or go back to nuclear, the big energy debate. So until you can tell me how we're going to make our energy, we can't possibly know how warm the planet's going to be. And if we don't know how warm the planet's going to be, how could we possibly tell you precisely how much ice is going to melt? And yet that's what people want to know. It's one of those things that's unknowable. I don't know how long I will live. It's a good I like to use simple metaphors. My father recently died at 100. I have good genes. Um, I could get hit by a car. I could go to my doctor next week and be told I have a fatal illness. There's lots of things that could happen. Now, from an insurance standpoint, that's okay because they say, well, out of 1,000 people, given John's, you know, history, et cetera, we think he'll live to 94 or something. And that's fine from an insurance company because it's an averaging thing with a big enough population. But nobody can tell me how long I'm going to live. I could make the case sometime between 68 and 100. Right? Well, we're being asked to do that with the glaciers and sea level. They're saying, tell me, Mr. Englander, how high will it be in the 30-year design life of this project? I can't do that. There's popular press articles. Antarctica is melting three times faster than just a decade ago. I need to speed up here. I'm going off subject, and I, uh, I ramble too much. Sorry. The, uh, that's the ice shelf in Antarctica. I talked about it earlier. Here's a good diagram that shows you the problem is the ice is being eaten away underneath, about 25 miles back in, 40 kilometers. And it eats away faster underneath because even though it's cold water, water is 800 times denser, therefore it has 800 times more heat in, in the water than a comparable quantity of air, and it has an effect to eat away at the ice. So the result of all that is that sea level rise is now unstoppable. Now, the, the truth is it happened before. Sea level rose 120,000 years ago. We didn't know that. Science tells us that. The Ice Age cycle is a fully natural cycle, had sea level cycling up and down 120 meters. If we'd known that 5,000 years ago, I'm sure we would have built our cities quite differently. We didn't. So the reason I know that sea level can't be stopped and the ocean heat's not going to go away because at the level of 410 parts per million of greenhouse gas, again, announced here 160 years ago, it's been calculated that the heat that we are adding to the ocean, the extraordinary heat, the unnatural heat, if you will, that's there because we've added to the greenhouse gas level that's gone from 280 to 410 is the equivalent of atomic bombs. Well, maybe I didn't say that right. It's the equivalent of 500,000 atomic bombs a day being exploded. That's five per second every minute, every day, around the clock. Sounds impossible, but again, the physics actually add up. By thickening or that greenhouse glass gas layer, like a sheet of glass, 
we're trapping heat. We've changed the 342 watts per square meter that come into the earth and that most of it was reflected. We just changed it by a couple of watts per, per square meter. But just like um, my weight, if I know my calories in and how much I burn in a day, if I have more coming in than going out, I'm going to get heavier, right? And the reverse is true. We're in balance, or should be, or hope to be. I'm not, but I hope to be. The earth is like that. The earth was in balance in space as an ecosystem, as a geosystem, as a land ocean system. We've now tipped it. Now, the good news is it's, we've got decades to begin adapting, but the problem is starts now. In fact, the problem was known 160 years ago or certainly 50 years ago, and we keep procrastinating. So I bring you back to that slide because this single image, and I've had a lot of leading scientists use this. In fact, Dr. Hansen used it, and Michael Mann, who you've probably read about, who's very outspoken and controversial, uses this. Uh, it really helps to explain this to people who don't understand it, and I certainly commend it. I hope you use it. The projections for sea level rise are generally wrong, as I alluded to. That's uh, in blue is various projections going back to 1990. Then in green, we've added different projections, which are a little bit higher and tighter, as happens with time. And then we can look back from the year uh, 2015 and say, how well did the projections do 10 and 20 years ago? Well, actual sea level is in gold, and the smoothed out trend line is in red. I think that's a fairly simple graph. The simple takeaway, though, is that with various efforts to project sea level growth over time, just in the last 10 and 20 years, both, we fell short that actual sea level rose faster than the projections. Again, that reinforces what we talked about earlier. So the reports, and this is the latest US government report. Um, actually, this was published the day before Donald Trump took office. Noah happened to have published it January 19th, 2017. And uh, it's interesting. They added another curve. The red line there is 2.4 meters. Eight feet two inches. That's their worst case scenario. That's a new line that didn't that wasn't there three or four years before that. But here's the thing: it's not going to follow any of those lines. I hope you understand enough now that these are just models. These are just things to say, well, if it's a half meter and if it's a meter or if it's a meter and a half, based upon what we know, it could be any of these. But it could jump lines because remember the three inflection points, sea level does follow bumps. It goes has abrupt changes. Now, abrupt isn't like next week. But could we get a foot or two a decade? Yeah. The last time we had really sudden sea level rise was 14,000 years ago. And it rose in 400 years, 65 feet. Think of that. That's an average of a half meter a decade, foot and a half. And that was an average over four centuries. So it's safe to say some of the decades, because again, it wasn't a smooth process. Okay? So can that happen in the next decade? No. I, there, I just do not. If people say, oh, we could get 10 feet of sea level rise this decade. Not, I, not possible. Just there's, there's no way the ice is going to change that quickly. But by mid-century, could we get a foot or two or three, a meter? Yeah. Now, a lot depends on what we do in the next 30 years. And we're not doing enough to slow the warming. The same sea level that is uh, shown here in a red line, that 8 or 10 inches against four, 13 US cities here, ranges from 46 inches to 30 to 14 and 4. The point is here that sea level will manifest differently in different places because the land moves up or down. And so that adds to the confusion. So in the high latitudes of Scandinavia or Alaska, um, the land is still uplifting because the ice receded there last, so there's glacial rebound. So the, the land is moving upward at half an inch a year, and sea level's moving up at a sixth of an inch a year, so it looks like sea level's falling in Alaska and northern Scandinavia. Well, that'll last for another decade or two until the melt rates from Greenland and Antarctica take over, and they'll then see what sea level rise is. 
this chart by Dr. James Hansen, I don't want to give uh, Dr. Hansen a lot of credit. I, he's my kind of hero and guru. Uh, I think most of you heard his name. Uh, this is a chart from a presentation he gave somewhere not too long ago. But it shows 800,000 years of carbon dioxide and temperature. And it's, it's interesting because it, it doesn't show the sea level directly, but you see how closely carbon dioxide and temperature have been linked for 800,000 years. But in the last century or so, look at how they're diverging. The carbon dioxide is moving much faster than the temperature. It take, there's a lag time. And there's a lag time from temperature to sea level. And that fools us. People say, well, how come if CO2 is 410 parts per million, you know, how come sea hasn't risen, you know, proportionally out? It doesn't work like that. You may have heard of the IPCC, a wonderful scientific enterprise, uh, part of the UN. Most people volunteer their time. 2,000 scientists participate. A report comes out every five or six years. And the two things which it understates, I don't think purposefully, but are methane release and sea level projections. And it's a methodology problem and, and a definition and, and so on, and I don't think time allows here, but it's a point of confusion because they run four scenarios and their extreme scenario says that we could get 92 centimeters or 32 inches of sea level this century in the worst scenario. Most people don't read the fine print and realize that excludes Antarctica. Does that make sense? I mean, actually, there's two inches in there from Antarctica in the worst case. The problem is they can't quantify it to their own requirements of being objectively derived and provable and so on, so they footnote it. Most people don't bother to read the footnote. So the key points are, I don't know if you can read this or not, but make it really simple. The sea level will continue to rise despite greenhouse gas reduction. Surprising, disappointing, unfortunate, but it's truth. The scientific predictions for sea level rise tend to underestimate due to the uncertainty of precisely how much will occur by the year 2100. When you phrase it that way, it makes sense, right? Anybody can understand that, quite frankly. But nobody explains it that way. The two key components are glacier movement, collapse in Greenland and Antarctica, both of which are accelerating. And we're headed back toward the situation that last existed 120,000 years ago. And this should really get our attention, because humans had no impact back then. And sea level got 25 feet higher than present. So even just being aware of the ice age cycles, we should be redesigning our coastal environment. Even without the warming. I mean, that's a you know, sobering thought, but again, truth is truth. And the fact is, we just didn't know that until we understood about the ice ages. Um, in red here shows the areas that are vulnerable if all the ice were to melt. It's surprisingly small. I mean, it's parts of Europe and England and the US, southeastern United States. But it's not like the world's going underwater. And that's with 60 meters or 200 feet of sea level rise. Now, that couldn't even happen for 500 years or maybe 5,000 years. But the point is, there's lots of areas in the world that are vulnerable, and we need to get a lot more specific. We need to start doing engineering creations. As I mentioned earlier, the Thames Barrier and the, Lund and the, uh, the Rotterdam Harbor Gates, the Maslant Kering, were both designed after the storm of February 1st, 1953, as an engineering response. But when they designed this, they planned on the worst, a 10,000-year storm and the worst river flooding from the Rhine, the Sheldon, the Meuse that came together there. And they said, oh, and sea level, let's plan on 30 centimeters a foot. Because when they designed this back in the 70s, coming out of the storm of uh, the North Sea storm a flood of 1953, that was the worst they could imagine. And yet the engineers have told me that if they were designing this today, it would be three meters higher. Because they didn't want to invest $800 million and have it outlive its design criteria. You've perhaps seen this rendering of London, what it would look like underwater, or with, uh, I think it's, uh, what was this, five meters? I can't remember. But cities all around the world are seeing real flooding. This is San Francisco, not a rendering. This San Francisco, many of you have been there, Great Embarcadero, the ferry buildings, Pier 39 with the sea lions and all that stuff, right? Well, that elevation was set 140 years ago. 
And San Francisco doesn't have subsidence or uplift, so it's pretty much showing reflecting sea level globally. And they have a tide gauge there at the Golden Gate Bridge, which is one of the oldest, is the oldest in America. And what's bothering them is that more days, the seawall's awash. And what are they going to do? They can't build it anew and lose the historic character. They need to get to the, the old piers. You know, it's, it, they're going to have to do something, but there's seven and a half miles of waterfront. Not easy questions, but it's not just iconic structures like that. This is a street in Florida, and they, the, the neighbors have put up a no-wake zone on the street. You heard that, okay? A no-wake zone on the street so that when there's king tides or peak high tides, that the cars won't drive so fast to throw a wake and splash salt water on, like, the truck on the right-hand side there. But there's boats in the background there. Now, this happens about 30 or 40 days a year. And as soon as the tidal, extreme high tide has dissipated, they take that sign down so that when they go to try and sell their house, <laughs> that the prospective buyers don't say, why do you have a wake sign on the street? We live in a strange world. It's changing in front of our eyes. There are some good things. Some technology will make a difference. This is from Saturday's news here in the UK that a biomass plant is experimenting about carbon capture to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. It's at a place of, where does it say? I'm sorry, I should know that. Uh, Drax at North Yorkshire, okay? And uh, in the lower right is a scheme called um, spray, it's a spray ship with the idea that if we spray salt water up on the clouds and get marine cloud brightening, we may improve the planet's reflectance and create a cooling effect. It's an interesting idea. Should be explored and experimented. Not going to be that expensive if we even try it. Now, it's not the solution, however, because even if that reduced the, carb the uh, solar energy, ocean acidification is still taking place. And I didn't talk about that. That's one of those ecological impacts. But... Carbon dioxide dissolved in the ocean changes the pH, makes it less alkaline. That has a really serious implication for the ocean food chain, starting with the phytoplankton up to the animals that feed on it. But there are technologies we should explore. We shouldn't be naive in thinking they're perfect solutions that can be painless and going to keep sea level where it is. I don't see any possibility of that, nor do any of my colleagues. Um, there are new technologies. This is a from a company called Jupiter Technologies that is doing advanced climate and flood models. They're only a year old this, this month, and, uh, but they're going beyond government efforts and academic efforts. They're hiring lots of them, and they're coming up with higher resolution down to square meters and down to not only years but months but even hours on a short-term basis of flood prediction. And they're trying to improve our modeling, and that's really valid and useful. We can design cities like this one from the Netherlands, or yes, from the Netherlands. This is uh, Lessingen, uh, down toward the coast with Belgium. And they've designed the city to have about eight or 10 meters of safety between where the water is on the far right and the building levels, and the buildings have a wash through. Uh, the lower floors by regulation have no critical equipment that would flood. Interesting design. Uh, Dutch engineering company Arcadis came up with this design for, for the Netherlands where you could have a combination of a covered roadway which actually became a, a, a height addition to the seawall. Clever idea. May work for in certain places. This is from Hamburg, Germany. Uh, actually, the town of Hoffen City. It's a new part of Hamburg. Uh, great place. I went there two years ago. And uh, they have sudden big river flooding from the Elbe River from the North Sea that happens regularly, and they've designed ways to have an enjoyable city that uh, where there can be short-term flooding, and the restaurants are protected on the ground floor, and the houses are a little bit higher, et cetera. So interesting adaptations, and we need to do that. We're going to have certainly floating cities. People always ask about them. But we're not going to take the 4 million residents of Miami and all put them all on houseboats or, or yachts, okay, or Bangladesh or Vietnam to put it in, in honest terms. We really need to start 
getting ahead of this. It's unprecedented. This hasn't happened in human history. We get a pass for our difficulty to believe it's going to happen. And I, and I mean that. This is not just political. We get attached to places, whether it be Miami or Nantucket or Cornwall or, or Liverpool or wherever, you know, or right here on the Thames, it's a tidal river. It's part of human nature. We get, we get attached to place. We like to go back where we were born or we were raised or our parents were buried or whatever. And uh, it's, it's, it's tough to think that for the first generation, we just got the short straw because sea level is going to rise. And it happened before naturally. This time we've triggered it. But either way, the fact that the ocean is going to be meters higher, 5 or 10 feet, is, is really disruptive. It's sad. So is getting older. Um, I think there's three takeaways that we need to reduce emissions. It's very important. We're not doing enough. We need to find pricing mechanisms for carbon so that we, what we're talking about right now is just the beginning, that we get far more aggressive to be incentivized broadly to get off of carbon in the next few decades. Absolutely important. But regardless of our success with that, even if, we're, even if we went 100% renewable energy tomorrow, no more coal or oil, we're still going to get sea level rise. That's the thing that most people don't know or never bothered to think about or been misled about, thinking that if we just do the right environmental energy things, we can stop global warming and climate change. We can't stop it in a, dead in its tracks. The oceans have a lot of heat. They're getting more heat by the day, and that heat's not going anywhere. And the sooner we begin to engineer for adaptation, the better. Tomorrow I'm excited. One of the reasons I'm here this week, uh, although Sean facilitated the time of this talk, but uh, tomorrow at the uh, Institute of Mechanical Engineers and the Institute of Marine Engineers, Scientists, Technology, where I'm a fellow, that we're beginning some programs to help engineers understand this so that they turn this into the kind of design criteria that will allow us to enjoy things for decades or 50 years out. We've got to do more. Um, this is sobering stuff. I, you know, obviously, I get that, and I've tried to get you to laugh a little bit, and you've been very kind. But there's risk and opportunity here. One of the things we have to do is find a way to think of the glass half empty and half full. You, I don't have the example here, I guess, but you know what I mean. We can always look at something and say, is it half full or half empty? And there's certainly a problem here, what we consider the glass half empty. But I can find a glass half full if I work at it. And so let me share it with you. One is, there could be a disaster tomorrow in the world where 200,000 people are again killed overnight by a tsunami. You can't plan for that. Earthquakes, volcanoes, that kind of thing. This can't happen at that speed. So a good thing about sea level rise is it's slow. We actually have 20 or 30 years to begin designing and building different. So that's an opportunity. The second thing, and that's a novel thought, I think, to, to just ponder, but the second thing is that from a financial standpoint, even if we lose trillions, some would say $10 trillion are at stake for going underwater this century. That's as good a guesstimate as any. Again, we don't know. We can't, there's no way of defining that. But let's assume that $10 trillion by the end of this century will be flooded of assets. That's a problem. But here's the good news. Because it's slow and people can get out of the way and will get out of the way with problems, we are going to have to create new places to live, new economies, new ports. We're going to have to re-engineer the coastal environment all over the world. This is not a Miami and New York and London problem. This is 10,000 coastal communities, and every place is on a tidal river. We have no choice. Somebody says, where did the money come from? I say, I don't know where the money's going to come from, sir. I know you're going to find it. Because it's not like, well, do I want a better museum, or do I want to you know, deal with sea level rise? I'm not dissing museums at all. Don't misunderstand me. But the point is, we can't argue with the ocean. We can't argue with a glacier. 
this is not an option. This is one of those things where, you know, it's not do I want to deal with it or not. Maybe you can leave it for your kids or grandkids to deal with. But I can turn that around and say it to you this way. Once we wake up to this reality, and more people understand this, and I'm going to tell you how you can help in a moment, and more people can understand this, there's a huge opportunity. Because rising sea level, multimeter, let's just call it three meters, for lack of a better number, five or ten feet, whatever system you want to look at, is going to be the biggest economic driver this century. Because we are going to have to re-engineer, rebuild, relocate, change everything from ports to marinas to beaches. In some places, we may be able to protect them with seawalls, but in places like Miami where it's porous limestone, the water is just going to come up through the, sea wall, through the ground. I didn't talk about that. Every place is different. So like it or not, adapting to sea rise, and I know this is a little bit cheeky, but it's going to be the biggest and best economic engine this century. Now, that's strange to think of it that way, but it's important to put it as an economic opportunity and a creative one because that's what engages people. I mean, I gave a talk to some military uh, engineering group, and they'd never heard of sea level rise like this, and they got it, but then we were in Jacksonville, Florida a year ago, just before the hurricane hit there and flooded the whole city, in fact, and uh, it was my third time I've predicted something happening, and it happened, so I'm not going to make any more predictions. Um, <laughs> My book came out the week of Hurricane Sandy, and I described it on page 121 and got a lot of press for that, fortunately, but just a freak kind of timing thing. But if you, if you understand the physics and what's going to happen, I mean, you can start to predict things in effect, in effect and have them come up, happen more often. So I was standing there in Jacksonville with 450 military engineers and uh, explained mostly what I did here, but then I, <laughs> and they were, they, were, they were silent and disbelief kind of, they'd never heard this message, and one of the admirals said that, so we never heard that sea level could rise meters, you know, in, in, in a time frame of, of a century. And I said, but you know, right here at the, the St. John's River, right by Naval Station Mayport, it's really narrow, it's like 200 feet across. I said, you could, write a, you could create a storm surge barrier there that when you had a storm coming to town, which on top of sea level will make it even worse, you could actually block the storm from coming up the channel. Well, they love that. All of a sudden, they're getting out paper and pencil and trying to sketch what the barrier will look like, and it's engaging them professionally. And that's good to do. We need to devise the adaptations. They will be done. Whether your firm or your profession deals with it or not, they are going to happen. This is not optional. Use that as a strength. I think I've covered all that. But the final point, my daughter a few years ago with a friend at the beach, is we have to rise with the tide. We really don't have a choice. I mean, the world's changed. I, I, you know, social media is a problem with kids, and, and uh, there's all sorts of things, and drugs, and violence, and schools. The world's a crazy place. But I hope you, the 300 people here tonight, agree with me that the facts about sea level are about as simple as ice melting. It's, an, it's, a, it's a part of climate change that you can explain to anybody. I actually seek out the groups that are doubters. I mean, explaining climate change to environmental groups is kind of like preaching to the choir, as they say. It's much more interesting to me to find libertarians or right-wing political groups um, that just have some predisposition to doubt, and I get to convert them and almost with a total success rate. I mean, I would say less than 2% of the people leave the room doubting. And that's great. And you can do that too. And what I ask of you, you paid your dues to come in here tonight, and we appreciate that, and, you, and it's great to support the Royal Institution, which is a wonderful institution, 220 years old here. But the thing I ask you to do beyond that well, is to explain this to three other people. We, we can change people's understanding of this because you know that you know a lot more tonight now than you did when you came in the room, no matter what you knew. So share that. Share that with coworkers, with family, with investors, your company, church groups, uh, town halls, 
Keep it simple. One of the things we tend to do with climate change is make it too complicated. You'll notice I didn't even use the word mitigate, one of the most popular words in climate discussions. Is, and I don't do it for two reasons. It's not a commonly used word. The average person, as I say, with a sixth grade education that's who newspapers write for, doesn't use mitigation very commonly. But the second part is mitigation refers to reducing the warming by reducing the growth of greenhouse gases, okay, mitigating the warming. It also means to mitigate the flood hazard and reduce flooding, which happens from the storms, the tides, and the sea level rise. So if in a conversation, I've been there with, with, in the States with NOAA and FEMA, and they're talking about mitigating, I say, which mitigate did you mean? And they never thought of it that way. So we should use common words. So I like to say we need to slow the warming by slowing the growth of greenhouse gases, and we need to reduce the flood hazards. Plain English really works. We tend to use jargon. We love jargon, initials and letters and mitigate and, and so on, okay? Good, at it, good explanation is, is plain language. That's the work of um, our International Sea Level Institute, which is our nonprofit. And, uh, we are looking for not only sponsors, but we're actually looking for a home, too. And it's been suggested to me in some of my work with the engineering societies that London has always been a maritime capital of the world, uh, still has IMO and that's International Maritime Organization. There I used initials. Uh, Lloyds of London and so on here. And, of course, uh, with the historic British Empire, there's, there's uh, global connections. So there's a decent argument for that, but we need to find support to do that, to open an office and hire uh, you know, a dozen people, perhaps. Uh, the second thing that I would make you aware of is that our institute is running um, a trip to Greenland in September that will be in part a fundraiser. People have to, it's for the major donors, so if, I'm not pushing on you to, to attend. It's only got seven spaces left in the trip. But for those that are capable, and it's a way to support the institute, so I, I do encourage you to do that. And uh, finally, I think, uh, Sean gave my, my Twitter address, uh, John Englander, but I'm on email, and I do a weekly blog. In fact, tomorrow's will refer to this meeting, so if you want to go online and uh, get a few words about how I feel about this meeting, which is very positive, of course, at um, johnenglander.net or Sea Level Rise Now, which is the name of the weekly blog, uh, I'm actually going to talk about this and some takeaways from this trip to London. So uh, you, may, you won't see yourself in the picture, but um, I, I do, uh, perhaps there's a connection there. And it's a weekly subscription every Tuesday morning. It's free, and I don't, there's no ads or anything. So uh, if you want to stay informed about this topic, it's a place to go. With that, I will uh, take questions. I know I'm a few minutes over time, but thank you. Thank you.